BNU Bias Academy, we started in uh, 2020 in April, like with the start of the pandemic, um, organizing webinars. And you can see we are quite a huge crowd of people involved in this. And for now, we had uh, 25 webinars that you can find the re recordings of online on YouTube channel. So please check this out. And uh, you can see that uh, we got, we both um, collected quite many registrations and many views. So we are very happy about this response to the, all the webinars. And we are now in the big data series. So we are, yeah, we had already like three very exciting and interesting talks about big data. And we are today at the fourth um, part of the series. We are, we'll be talking about visualization and sharing and annotation in the cloud. And the entire series had been mainly organized by Romain Guyet at IPFL, Marion Louveau at the Institut Pasteur, and Julian Colombelli and Sebastian Tossi. And also, like, also today with us, and also May Central is uh, Doko Dantuono, and he is also very kindly um, hosting the session on Zoom. So for today's session, we have several speakers. So we have um, the first part of the session will be about uh, CatMate by Tom Casimirs, and he is a um, consultant in software solutions, but for now, but he is uh, still very involved in all the projects that he had been scientifically involved before. And we are happy that he is talking about Ketme today. And um, together with him, uh, uh, Chris Barnes and Albert Cardona. So we are uh, really welcome you and they will help also to answer all your questions, which is really great. And then the second part is um, about Mobi. And here we have Christian Tischer, Konstantin Pape, and Kimberly Mikan. And they, uh, yeah, they will all three talk and all three answer your questions. And then from New Bias Academy part, it's uh, Rocco Danfono. Again, uh, thanks for, for hosting the webinar also, and Julian Colombelli and me. And with this, I give the floor to Tom. I should stop sharing. And uh, yeah, again, please ask many questions in the Q&A window. Hello, everybody. And uh, welcome to uh, the first talk of today's uh, New BS Academy session on data in the cloud. Um, there has been sort of a last minute change. Um, today, Albert uh, won't be presenting with me, but he'll be there to answer questions. So it will be only me talking about CADMATE, which is a collaborative web-based tool for online image browsing, image annotation, and with uh, sort of specialized tools for neuron reconstruction, proofreading, and circuit analysis. So there is a clear neuroscience focus in this tool, but uh, it's got its broader uses, of course, as well. Um, as an open source project, it's been used around the world uh, in quite a few different labs with many different data sets and uh, data modalities. But uh, even after a 10-year history uh, already of the software uh, series section, transmission electron microscopy is still uh, the most prominent uh, data modality used. A um, little bit of background. Um, Albert uh, is a group leader for experimental and comparative connectomics at the MRC LMB in Cambridge in the UK. And uh, he's been working and contributing to the connectomics fields, a field for many years now. And before he was in Cambridge, he was at Janelia Research Campus in Ashburn, Virginia, uh, in the United States for uh, many years. And that's also where I worked with Albert for many years and became the main developer of CADMATE. And since last year, I'm back in Germany as an open source research software engineer at my own consultancy, Cosmos. And oops. Uh, before I get into CADMATE, I'd like to uh, offer a few thoughts uh, on big data in general and the types of data that we deal with in the context of CADMATE and, uh, and our research. And after that, I'll talk about, uh, give an overview on CADMATE and try to explain general ideas in the software. And the little cat icon you see there is CADMATE's logo and mascot, Skelly. And after that, after I provided sort of a big picture overview, I go, uh, I go to a live training instance 
a tracing instance that uh, is that we will where we'll explore some features a little bit more. Um, we will look at account creation, uh, basic project setup, and uh, some general light microscopy data uh, handling options, as, and spend most of the time uh, with respect to tracing tools. Okay, uh, so maybe as some motivational thoughts of uh, of data in the clouds or cloud or the data that we typically deal with. Um, when I read data in the cloud, what I typically parse it as or understand it as is basically some online resource. There is the saying that uh, data in the cloud is just, uh, or the cloud is just someone else's computer. And that's ultimately true. Um, when we talk about data in the cloud, we talk about data that is made available through remote services, um, at least from a client perspective. And this remote service can be a single computer, but it could also be, of course, the whole array of computers like Google Cloud Storage or Amazon S3 and so on. Uh, but in the, most, in the simplest case, it's still something you can host on a server and manage yourself. Ultimately, the data sizes that we talk about at, uh, in this context here is usually uh, multiple terabytes, in some extent, uh, instances also more. But typically, this is the range of data that we work with. But this already makes it hard to copy it as uh, sort of traditional, uh, like traditional image files, since uh, copying a multiple terabyte data set consisting of many files takes some time and storage and planning too. Um, therefore, a setup of these cloud services and cloud service providers uh, is usually more involved, also with respect to permissions uh, that have to be thought uh, uh, through. Uh, but ultimately, uh, it offers a lot of gains also for people and users with lower spec devices, um, where you can suddenly access data in a uh, often optimized uh, fashion that you can access it randomly, also with small chunks just uh, out of this data set, instead of a uh, downloading much more. Um, like I said already initially, we mainly deal with uh, zero section transmission electron microscopy data. So I uh, found this old slide again, um, an old publication, which explains this very nicely. Um, so just as a quick refresher on what this is, we basically usually slice up data sets, a uh, specimen in uh, individual slices of typically 40 to 50 nanometers thickness, and then re-image or image on the plane with much higher resolution, resulting in these gigantic image stacks where, of course, things can go wrong. Um, sections are lost, sometimes you have artifacts, and so any software that has to deal with uh, data, uh, with this their type of data, or generally data, has to also be aware of problems that might come with this, with this data, like uh, missing sections, for instance. Uh, but not to belabor this uh, too much, uh, just as a sort of reference, the data sets that I've been working with mostly over the past years has been for one Albert's uh, Trosafila L1 data set, which is roughly a terabyte in JPEG tiles. Um, so that some pre-processing is required to make this available. And also over the last years, I've worked a lot with Davi Box uh, 5B data set, which is as stored as compressed JPEG tiles about 11 terabytes. And these uh, data sets are already large enough to make it complicated to not have them accessible online and having everyone to, uh, having everyone to copy it to local machines is just not feasible. Um, then in, late, in last years, uh, other technologies like FIPSAM become more popular, and the date which increased the resolution in terms of zero res resolution much more. And so a lot of data, data is now also available as chunked data, where each uh, block in this example, for instance, of the Janelia Hemi brain data set consists of 64 by 64 by 64 voxels. Mm -hmm. And these are typical data sets that CatMate can load and talk to. And, uh, represent sort of the realm of data that we typically work with. Um, so now speaking uh, more about CatMate, um, as most of you or some of you might know already, CatMate is an acronym for the Collaborative Annotation Toolkit for Massive Amounts of Image Data. And it's fitting quite well into the uh, name of this uh, Neubier session here, uh, therefore. And given the size of the data that we work with, um, it seemed very useful to us initially to have a tool that allows collaborative access in, uh, in a way so that not everybody needs to work in their own environment and it's hard to merge data. So CatMate provides an interface to allow multiple people, multiple people to work on the same data. And since uh, 
probably quite a few of you haven't never heard of CADMATE or used it. So to put a picture in your mind of what a typical CADMATE user interface looks like, um, I use this as an example here. Maybe generally you should know CADMATE is a web application. So you would normally, normally open it, it up in a browser window and connect to a website, the CADMATE server. And then depending on the available data, you could dive into data and in the FAFB universe, for instance, uh, the adult fly brain uh, data set, a common workplace might look like this, where um, you see uh, individual widgets and tools in CADMATE that are all interconnected. In this screenshot, we see, for instance, on the left-hand side, EM data, um, zero section EM data with magenta dots on it, representing individual nodes of neurons that have been manually placed and traced. And these neurons then can be visualized, for instance, in 3D, like it is visible in the second column, along with synapses and some brain compartments. And on the next column, again, on the third column, you see a graph representation of the local network and some other connectivity-related tools. Um, uh, don't worry so much about the details of what exactly is going on here. The takeaway is more that CADMATE consists of many individual tools that are interconnected and allow you as a user to send uh, data between them. So it's easy to send uh, this collection of neurons that is visible in 3D to a graph widget and quickly inspect a graph representation of, of this data. We will see more of this uh, later on in the demo. Um, another typical use case for us has been in the last year to look for similarities between neurons. Um, for this, we use uh, Greg Jeffries and Marta Costa's uh, NBLAS algorithm, and we put a front end basically uh, to it to allow users to more easily navigate the tools and use it. And it allows us, for instance, to search for similar neurons uh, um, in the brain and also transform neurons of similar shape so that we could, for instance, look for contralateral homologues on the other side of the brain and uh, all this is possible with CADMATE. So this is more uh, of an example of what you can do with it. Um, so let's maybe take a step back and think of uh, how generally CADMATE projects are um, constructed or made of to get to, to, go, yeah, trans, uh, to explain a little bit better of uh, how these things are structured. Generally, projects in CADMATE are the spaces uh, where users can create data. And so everything from notes that they create from annotations or text tags, all this in a project. Image data is mapped into those projects and you can map many, many different images into the same project. And maybe sometimes you have, for instance, a higher resolution uh, re-imaging of a data set that you want to add to your project. This is all possible in CADMATE, so you can have many stacks and overlay them on each other. We will say that they see this later too. Um, image data generally can have mirrors because we found in a collaborative environment that potentially has users all around the world. Um, it is much easier for on the users and the latency they experience with loading data when the data can be close to them. So co-location is important also with cloud data uh, or ser data served from the cloud. Um, so there were many instances where we shipped uh, data sets to users so that we can and taught CADMAs to respect the local data uh, to use that instead, which helped in many instances to gain speed uh, for, uh, for data access. Generally, also to represent uh, multi-channel data, CADMATE will collect stacks in, or image stacks into so-called stack groups. Um, image data in CADMATE in general, given that we typically talk about large image data sets, um, is, uh, or adding image data isn't a frequent operation normally or in most scenarios that we worked with. So this is currently still an admin or uh, CADMATE admin op uh, operation that data is added to a server. Um, but over time, uh, it, some, so there are some ways where users can create own projects and own data themselves that we will briefly look into, la uh, into later. Generally, CADMATE is agnostic uh, with respect to the data as long as the browser can render it in some way. Um, and this means we, used, we have to used it successfully with light data and electron microscopy data, single and multi-channel data is all uh, no problem at all. Um, most common still are regular tiles, but more and more um, isotropic data sets appear. So block-based representation like neural plans are pre-computed and like N5 are uh, more and more common and CADMIT can uh, talk and read both of them, of course. Um, a benefit these block-based formats have is that they provide orthogonal views, um, 
relatively easily or to, at no cost, basically, meaning it is easy for CADMATE or generally any other user of this data to look at it from the side or from different perspectives um, because the data is uh, already presented in ways in these blocks that this makes this much easier. And even though CADMATE is focused on neural reconstruction, there are other annotation modes possible. Generally, of course, you can have simple text annotations and location annotations in a data set. And you can have annotations uh, on whole data sets that is backed by an ontology, meaning that users can define a predefined set of vocabulary of terms and relations between those terms that can then be used to annotate image data. Um, and since this is a very structured form of image or term annotation, uh, this data can then be la later used uh, to, for instance, cluster based on the annotations that users did uh, on individual image data sets. Um, but since tracing uh, and neural reconstruction is sort of the focus of CADMATE, I'd like to spend a little bit more time on this as well and explain the general workflow and thought process that uh, is going on in the manual reconstruction environment. Um, generally, um, we assume often that for neural reconstruction, the approach is a question-directed one, meaning that people have interest in a particular circuit and a particular neuron, a group of neurons, and so on, and would dive locally into the data set and start reconstructing data there if nothing, no one else already did that at this point. And this tracing and exploratory uh, data creation in the data set uh, then at some point allows you to analyze what you have already and get a better picture of the environment of the data you create. Uh, meaning that you can, for instance, quickly look uh, after you created a small network, how does this network look in a graph representation? What typical connectivity patterns can you find there? And this then again allows you to, uh, uh, this then again informs your decisions for continued tracing. So in CADMATE it's really important that you can quickly switch these perspectives between creating data, tracing data, and analysis, and have this be sort of a workflow um, when reconstructing um, neuron morphology and connectivity. And ultimately, all these neurons form, of course, graphs. And while the morphology is interesting, we are typically more inform uh, interested in the connectivity as well. Um, so let me quickly uh, explain how these graphs are represented in CADMATE. Uh, neurons, as you know, connect to each other through synapses, and there are different types of synapses, and CADMATE allows you to annotate different types of synapses and different connectivity uh, or relations between neurons altogether, but I'll stick to regular synapses here. Um, where in this example, um, all these orange and red and yellow neurons are first sort of downstream partners of the green neuron we see on the right-hand side, and if we switch on uh, synapses, we see already how quickly uh, these networks grow and uh, indicate how quickly uh, the how large these networks can can become. So these neurons that uh, to make this approachable in some way on a technical level and also sort of constrain what user, users can do. Uh, neurons in CADMATE are uh, strict tree structures, and what this means is that they basically have a, a single root node and everything else expands from there, and this is important or makes some technical uh, traversals or uh, uh, makes it easier to traverse the neurons on the technical side, the database, but makes it also a little bit uh, more robust to user error in some cases. And in this case, for instance, you would see uh, the segments of the skeleton getting darker that are farther away from this root node. Looking only at a topology of a neuron would maybe look something like this in this strict tree representation where in the center you have the soma, the cell body, and everything else branches away from there. And individual neurons in CADMIT then uh, represent these synapses uh, in the following way. Users would place nodes in the data sets, uh, regular tree nodes that uh, would make up a skeleton or a neuron representation. And then at a synapse location, they would create these connector nodes and use them as hubs basically to con uh, connect to uh, partner skeleton nodes. And uh, there are different types of uh, connectors or synapses, as I said, but in this example, it is a regular pre and post synaptic uh, terminal. And then these synapses, of course, form complex graphs uh, like this, and like we've seen in the screenshot before, and CADMATE then helps 
uh, dissecting these graphs and hiding away features that might not be relevant. And uh, there's a lot of uh, threshold options in many analysis tools where you can say, for instance, to only respect connectivity over a th certain threshold so that you can quickly get a better understanding of these graphs that uh, are formed by user input. Um, another aspect of CADMATE is that it is able to talk to other CADMATE servers. Um, there is a so-called federation mode where a CADMATE user can link in remote data from other public CADMATE instances. For instance, uh, there are a few uh, public read-only CADMATE services that provides, for instance, a skeletonized version of segmented th uh, of a segmentation of the FAFB data set that has been generated by Google. Then there is a synaptic a synapse segmentation data set living in another CADMATE instance that has been uh, generated by uh, Julia Buhmann and Jan Funke and Stefan Gerhard. And these then can be administered and worked with independently of a main production instance, but it allows users to link this data in and sort of pick and choose what they need for their work. Um, with this sort of fast uh, uh, run through some CutMate features and general uh, principles, I'd like now to jump over to an actual CutMate instance. And I hope you see my browser tab switched. And I went to a public CutMate service called spaces.etana.io. And on there, um, there are a couple of published projects along with neurons also available in these projects um, hosted. And even without being logged in, as you can see in the upper right corner, I'm anonymous at the moment, I'll get presented the start page uh, with um, all the available data. And I can click on the data and jump in and of course, like browse the uh, 5B data set uh, and all this works fine. And since this has been made accessible for anonymous access as well. However, as an anonymous user, uh, anonymous user, I wouldn't be able to create data. So maybe as uh, the first thing that we can do on this server here is that I will create an account. And depending on the server setup, this can happen in multiple ways. Uh, some servers allow you to register directly, but on this server, we can use um, org IDs or ORCIDs uh, to log in and have CADMIT create an account. If I hover my mouse cursor over, over the login button, it says login with ORCID. And if I press OK, it will uh, redirect me there. And luckily, I stored my password. And it will redirect me back to CADMATE. And now I have an actual CADMATE account backed by this ORCID uh, ID that I have. There are other services that you can interconnect in this way. It uses OAuth2 as a fairly common format for authentication. Um, a protocol for authentication. And this allowed us now to create an account here. Um, ultimately, the view doesn't look very different because as a new user, I don't see much else as a uh, registered user on this service. Um, but we will need this account later when we actually want to modify and create data. Um, to give you, give you a better idea of um, general navigation and image uh, usage uh, in CADMATE, um, or image displaying CADMIT, um, I'd like to uh, look at a few light data sets first. In this uh, list of projects at the bottom here, we have a bunch of uh, Drosophila uh, RAP protein uh, light uh, images. Uh, and I just click the first link in there, and uh, this shows us nothing, mainly because we are at the top of the stack. And this might be a little bit dark, this blue. And I basically chose from a CADMATE project the first stack available. And in this image stack, uh, like I said, this is a light stack. We have multiple uh, channels uh, available. In this case, we just opened the first Darby channel uh, with uh, blue as a false coloring. And it's easy to add additional stacks. Now, for instance, can we add the second ch channel, the wrap channel, in a second view in CADMATE, as we can see here? And uh, they would move and synchronously and zoom synchronously, at, uh, et cetera. Um, but typically for light data, it is more interesting to actually add uh, a stack to the focus viewer. So let me close this. Um, and as you can see this way, you can overlay individual stacks and 
uh, get to typical light microscopy representations. In the lower left corner of Catmate Stack Viewer, the thing where you can actually see image data, um, you have this little hamburger menu, which provides access to a uh, uh, full host of uh, layer settings for the display data. In this case, it allows you to modify the coloring. It allows you to allow uh, modify blending options and so on. Uh, due to the a little time, I won't go into much detail here. Uh, but generally, it's good to know that you can adjust, uh, say, the coloring in some form. And then, um, for instance, let's make this red and save this as a default. So generally, if you configure um, data in CADMIT so that it looks best for you and for your use case, you can save this as a default. And then every time you open this image stack, it will load with these settings. Um, this is especially useful for light data, of course, where you have maybe more complicated setups than for a single EM uh, data set. Okay, now with this in mind, let's close this project again. And maybe good to know as well as, so we, we looked at, uh, just at this RUB18 seen as one project, uh, which has the different, uh, different stacks linked into it um, that we just saw. And of course, it's not really practical for light data to uh, always select individual stacks. So you can teach CapMate also to load all stacks at the same time for light data. So you can have this be generated automatically. And oops, uh, sorry. And this will then bring up the uh, pre-configured version, like you see the red that we just configured um, in one go, which makes it sometimes a little bit easier. Okay. Also, even though we only have four different projects here on this front page of CatMate, it could be uh, get cluttered pretty quickly if you have many projects. Um, and especially in the light microscopy context, this is common that you can up with hun hundreds of those. So it is convenient to build different views that represent better what you actually, uh, how you want to access the data. So for instance, it is possible in CatMate to tag individual projects and build uh, other views uh, for uh, data access. So in the upper left corner, you see this little menu which provides different views. And for instance, I prepared one that would pick up text from our four light data projects where we just looked at one and builds a matrix based from these tags. So it's relatively easy to automate a process where you'd have ongoing light data images come into your CatMate, tag them automatically and appear in such a matrix. Um, Rocco? Can you, uh, I said Rocco, <laughs> Tom, can you <laughs> enlarge the font size a bit? Of course. Is that better? Yes. Thanks a lot. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Um, okay. So, but let's go back to uh, the front view. Um, now we had a brief look at, uh, at light data and ways to organize the front page and, uh, or at least me saying that this is possible. Um, and what, uh, one last aspect to this is that in, if you have configured front pages that look more or help you navigate the data, you can make them your default front view by clicking uh, the little home icon in the menu here. Okay, so now let's move on to EM data and tracing data. Um, let me maybe zoom out a little bit again. Just, just a second. Otherwise, it gets too small here. Okay. Um, okay, so now we opened the EM data set that we looked at earlier on already. And here we could also switch on the tracing data, for instance. And you see already neurons popping up. These are uh, published neurons in the FAFB data set. And we could uh, click individual neurons uh, and open, for instance, the 3D viewer, which I uh, do by clicking the 3D buttons and the button, the top toolbar. And with a neuron selected, I can, like with many or almost all tools in CatMate, append the current selection of uh, skeletons or neurons uh, to the active widget. In this case, in the lower right corner, I'm clicking append uh, to select the active neuron, and which is selected in the source panel here, the active skeleton, appended to this list, meaning that it will show up here in 3D. And this 3D viewer behaves just like any other 3D viewer. Um, what you can do, for instance, is give it a little bit nicer shading. So it's not so much about the details here, what I pick, uh, just to show you um, 
that you can easily and quickly modify uh, the visual appearance of these neurons. And you can, of course, load more into this. And one thing that might be handy if you exploring data this way, and sometimes you find something interesting that you want to share with someone else, you can, of course, share uh, the location. Or let me maybe zoom in a little bit more to actually be able to compare locations. Um, and typically in CatMate, you do this with this URL to this view button in the upper right corner. If I just click it and open a link in the new view, in a new view, it will open a new browser tab, um, bringing me back to the very same location like we've seen here. However, it will uh, not uh, copy all the front end state like uh, our nice visualization that we just uh, uh, selected here. So what we can do is in instead is uh, create a short URL, which allows you to do exactly this. There are different shortcut up cut options in the menu up here, but they are all can be configured from this first entry, which gives you some user interface dialogue to configure such a link. So for instance, if we wanted to send this link to someone else, we could even say, uh, provide a little message and say, hello. And if we wanted, we can give it an alias, which makes it nice to link from, uh, say, a tweet. Um, otherwise, we will have YouTube-like short links. And creating this link, and we'll copy it to the clipboard. And now running this link and opening it should bring us to the very same view that we've seen before. Um, so in this way, by using uh, customized links and short links, we can basically share the full front end state of CatMate, which has been proven very useful in the past. Um, now with, let me, uh, with this neuron loaded, it might be interesting to also look at some uh, meshes and volumes. Uh, luckily in this data set, we have quite a few of them. So we might be wondering what brain compartments does this neuron um, innovate? So just to give you a better idea of the general lay of land, in the volumes and geometry tab, I will add a new volume, which is CatMate lingo for meshes, basically. And we can see the full adult fly brain here. Um, let me use uh, have it use faces instead of wireframes. And we can see our neuron here. And of course, well, innovates this, this is obvious, uh, but we can also check what other volumes it might interact with and intersects. So, uh, and luckily in this data set, we have uh, quite a few volumes, like I said, and in the volume manager tab uh, uh, widget, which is uh, the little box icon in the upper right corner, um, you can see all these volumes. Um, depending on your screen size, you might not actually see these icons uh, because they get, uh, uh, get invisible if this sp uh, space isn't there. What you can do instead is like with any widget in CatMate, you can open it through the open widget dialog, which is the first icon in the top. Um, and doing the, so gives you access to all the different icons, uh, different widgets in CatMate. So for instance, also the volume manager that we just opened through the icon button, we could also have opened here. Um, since it opens open already, um, let's uh, use the existing widget. And in here, we can now ask for the active skeleton, what neurons, uh, what meshes are actually uh, intersected by this particular neuron. And we let it run the computation on the back end. And this isn't, in this case, it isn't pre-computed. So it actually goes through all the neurons and does the check, and I, yep, does the test, and it does take a small moment. It should be there in a second. OK, and now we got. Uh, a few suggestions. So maybe let's have a look at uh, SIP, right? Um, I had some color. Um, and now we found out that apparently this volume intersects this uh, neuron here. And it might be interesting now to ask. Um, well, how much of this neuron is in fact in this compartment of the brain? And answers like this is something that CatMate can answer. Let me close the volume manager again. And as you already notice, uh, screen real estate in CatMate is uh, uh, scarce to some extent. That's why uh, this window manager is very handy that you can basically move windows around and tap windows and basically maximize the screen space you have. And uh, 
just since it isn't mentioned often in the lower right corner, you have also a sort of full screen button and you can hide all the uh, user controls away if that is needed. Um, okay, but we wanted to find out how much of this neuron is basically included in such a volume. And what we can do now is first um, add a filter to the 3D viewer. Many tools in CatMate and many widgets in CatMate do have this little filter icon in the top toolbar. And we see this is a 3D viewer. And we click this funnel icon and it allows us to add filters. For instance, it allows us to add volume filters. And we can add the um, SLP right uh, volume. That's, I think, what, no, SIP is what I added here. Sorry. SIP right. We don't need to invert. Okay. And as we can see, this is only a really small fraction that is, that is in fact uh, included in this volume here. Um, everything else is basically hidden now, now that we activated this filter. And we can use the very same filter uh, to actually do measurements. Many widgets in CatMate do support these kind of filters. And if we go back into our selection table, where we initially added our neuron to, um, we have a measurement button here which opens yet another widget. And let me also put this into this tab view here, uh, which provides some basic measurements for this uh, neuron. And here as well, we could now add a volume filter. Let me do this. Yeah, okay. And this takes a moment and now it tells us exactly how much uh, cable length and how many nodes are in here in this particular volume. Um, maybe more useful, this is even for connectivity analysis, analysis where you can look at the connectivity in individual uh, brain compartments. Okay, let me close this again. And now we are still in an environment here where we have a user account, but we are still looking at read-only data. Um, in this data set, I cannot, if I uh, create new data, if I enable tracing mode through uh, this little button up here and click anywhere, I get a you don't have permissions uh, error. error. Uh, and to change this, I can of course not just override the permissions of existing projects, but I, but I can create my own project based on those. So for instance, if I were a teacher um, and wanted to have my class trace in a data set to maybe learn something about biology, I could create my own class here and uh, or my own project here based off of this one or this project, for example, and then distribute a link to this and uh, my students would then be able to uh, have to write, have write access in this uh, uh, particular new project. So if I wanted to do something like this and be, or maybe for training purposes, I could uh, uh, go uh, into the uh, user menu that appears when I hover my mouse cursor over my username and click create own space. If I do so, um, a dialog pops up and asking me for a name for my space. I'll just keep it with the I keep the default here. Doesn't really matter. I want all the volumes to be available in this project, also to be available in the new project, and to kind of make this scenario work where I give other people, for instance, students, access uh, to this data set. I could say create a project project token, which is something like an invitation link and can assign some permissions with it and can say, for instance, everybody who will have access to this token should be able to read and write in this project and let's ignore the other permissions for now. And I'm creating a copy. And this now created successfully in the background a new CatMate project for me and created this project token, which I can copy. Oh, I think I copied it, uh, let's see. Uh, nope. Just a second, make sure. Yeah, okay, now I have copied it, good. Um, the dialogue would now allow me to switch directly to this new project if I do so and try to create notes here. This actually starts working and I have permission. This is now my own project. I can create new data. This is of course bogus data there, but everybody that I would now allow to, or that I want to have access to this project to and work collaboratively with me in this project, I could now give this uh, project token, which I can also look up later in a project management tool within CatMate. 
and this person uh, would then be able to get access to this project. So this person, what this would, person would need to do is the following. They would need to create an account and they would in the user menu uh, click use project token. And if they do this and paste the link that they maybe got by email, um, Catmate will also ask, and, uh, ask them if they want to switch to this new project. Let's do this not uh, for now. Um, but it registered basically that this new user, in this case, it's still me. So I didn't gain any new access uh, because I had access to this project already, but a user who wouldn't have had access already um, would have gained access now. Since uh, of course, if many people do this, uh, a view like this uh, doesn't help uh, and clutters the space relatively quickly. And what you can do to access these kinds of spaces more easily is to go to the My Projects view, which keeps all those projects that you explicitly register for and provides now access to this uh, new project. Um, this now allows you to basically collaborate relatively easily without any external help in a new project. Um, in this cat, this Cadme project is completely empty at the moment. And uh, because it is uh, the neurons that we've seen before are part of the other project, we can, however, link them in uh, remotely and make them available as extra layers here in this, uh, uh, in this project so that we could, for instance, import already published neurons in this data set and work with those. Um, and we could probably uh, try this. So in this case, I added uh, remote data from the project that we originally started with um, to this project and suddenly data starts to appear here. Let me see if I uh, can probably load also even more data. So this, for instance, is uh, remote data available that is uh, the skeletonized segmentation of the whole data set uh, uh, that, we, uh, that was created in a collaboration with Google. And suddenly, our space is filled. And this way, we can relatively quickly uh, pick and choose what is relevant for us. Um, now that I see that the time is already running out already almost for this session, let me get back to the slides. Um, since this only uh, the time we have only allowed for a brief overview and various features, there are many things that could be explained in more details and we didn't look at any connectivity tools and there is much more to look at, but maybe this already helped you to get a better understanding on overall workflows and possibilities in CatMate. And oops, uh, and with uh, this, I'd like also to say thank you to many people. Um, like I said, CatMate's been around for uh, 10 years now, pretty much, um, maybe even a little longer. Um, and over the time, many people have contributed to this project and used it and uh, used it for many different purposes. So thanks to uh, many people involved here. And with this, I. Uh, wonder if you have maybe any questions um, that I can be answered right here. And otherwise, there is more information available on the, on the web. Send me an email or uh, uh, try CatMate yourself. And maybe as a last, oops, a last thing to mention, um, we are looking as a project for Google, uh, for students that want to participate in the Google Summer of Code. And the Cardona Lab as well is looking for software engineers if you want to work on software like this and related topics uh, that might be a good address to ask. Um, thanks for your attention and your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thanks a lot, Tom. That was really nice. Very impressive uh, data and handling. <laughs> And uh, there were a few questions, but uh, Albert was extremely fast in replying to all of them. So it was <laughs> like about uh, yeah, which species uh, or what kind of data can it handle from which species can it come or from, yeah. And then it was also about um, like what what uh, hardware requirements does it have? But maybe since they are already answered, <laughs> I, um, I was I would have maybe one question, and this is sure. if you could give a impress like you had like for the 
Drosophila projects that had been worked on, like how many collaborators, I was interested a bit in the numbers, let's say, like how oh, many collaborators okay. were working on this and what is, like how many neurons were traced and so on, just to give, get a bit of an impression of that. Right. Um, so I, I, know, I didn't prepare, I didn't look up any specific numbers, so I yeah, sure. uh, don't want to say any, any wrong numbers, but over the time, um, like many uh, people obviously were involved in this and I can't so much say for the L1 project. I remember that uh, the last numbers uh, one and a half years ago I looked up for 5B was that the total uh, that was produced by manual reconstruction was something like seven or eight meters in total of mm. brain wiring in a Drosophila brain, which is like a lot uh, of, mm. of cable length. And of course, with the advent of uh, segmentation phase uh, or skeletonized segmentations in CatMate, um, that is easy to top, but uh, even seven or eight meters already is an impressive number for, and I think it's maybe around 200 people that contributed to that number back then. Um, but this is also to say that CatMate can handle many people at the same time working in the same spot, um, which is needed also for some of this uh, of those data sets. Okay, thanks. Cool. Very. <laughs> That's quite a, <laughs> okay. a dimension. Uh, and maybe there's one last question appearing here. So that was like, uh, can CatMate deal with time series of 3D data sets? Um, not natively at the moment. Mm. There were some attempts in the past to make this happen. But at the moment, um, we can on we only support three dimensions basically directly. Um, yeah, yeah. So basically, for now, we don't support time series. What maybe we, it's one way to represent it, but with a sort of different tool in CatMate is the fact that CatMate stores all changes. So there are history tables uh, associated with every database table, basically, and we can easily sort of easily roll back. Uh, changes and this potentially would also allow to re be to represent time series to always only have the latest state represented um, in the database uh, but this doesn't sound like the right tool for this okay then thanks a lot thanks again a lot for the presentation and sure. then we hand on to the mobi team okay i'll stop you sharing to, exactly thank you okay and then i'll try to share my screen. Can you see this? Yep. Okay. Yeah, so um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the second part of this webinar, where we will talk about Mobi. So first, uh, let me introduce us. So I'm Konstantin. And uh, also joining me as uh, speakers will be Kimberly and Christian. And we are sort of the three main developers behind Mobi, which is a tool for multimodal big image data sharing and exploration, which we'll of course talk about further. Um, and yeah, all three of us are at Ample Heidelberg. And we also sort of got a lot of feedback and um, help in implementing this from Valentina, Martin, Hernando, Detlef, Anna, and Yannick, who are also at EMBL Heidelberg. So, um, yeah, I will give you a short overview of, of what Mobi is and the ideas behind it. And then both Christian and Kimberly will show you how the tool actually works in true live demos. So yeah, what is Mobi in the nutshell? So um, yeah, like I already said, the idea behind Mobi is to have a toolkit for sharing and exploring large multimodal data and for doing this locally and in the cloud. So at the core, this means Mobi has basically two parts. So the first is a data specification for large multimodal data. So before we dive into this, when we talk about multimodal data um, here, we mean sort of you have one data set, which sort of yeah, shows a common specimen or organism, and which represents this in multiple modalities. For example, with electron microscopy data or um, light microscopy data. And I mean, you can think of many examples here. Like one prime example would be correlative electron microscopy data, where you have like EM showing a sample and then also different light microscopy sort of sources for the same sample. And in addition to these sort of primary modalities, 
we also want to support different kinds of, of derived data. So sort of the, uh, the main type of data we support right now are sort of segmentations that highlight different kinds of objects in the sample that you have, like segmentations of cells or organelles. But other examples would be things like neuron traces, which we've already seen in yeah, the talk before by Tom. And um, then lastly, right, sort of the key thing that makes this all work is that we um, base this data specification on existing data formats for big image data. Um, and I'll talk about this more later. And then the second part of, of Mobi is a Fiji plugin that basically offers a viewer to browse this data um, sort of from local sources and from remote sources. And it's based on Big Data Viewer, which is sort of the yeah, tool in, in Fiji to look at large image data. And our plugin is just easily available via Fiji update site, which is just called Mobi. Before we talk more about Mobi itself, I want to quick, uh, yeah, quickly give you the history of the project. So it's a fairly new project. So, I mean, we maybe started working on it like two years ago and sort of that it's actually been released is more like a year ago. And yeah, the sort of motivation to start on this, it comes from this Platinarius Atlas project. Um, where the, the goal is sort of to correlate morphological and genetic expression on, on a cellular level for this data set that shows a uh, platinarius dumerili larva. And in this data set, we have basically three different modalities. First, we have the serial block phase data, which shows sort of, uh, yeah, uh, the whole animal of, or the whole larva at six days old of platinarius at sort of fairly high resolution at 10 times 10 times 25 nanometers. And, and this data set has like yeah, it's eight terabytes of raw data, so fairly large already. Um, then we have like these in situ light microscopy the images that show different genetic markers. And these are sort of much smaller. They are only at 500 nanometer resolution, but we have 220 or so of these volumes showing different genetic markers. And then um, finally, we also have segmentations that are derived from the EM data via um, some machine learning approaches that segment all the cells and some organelles and tissues in the data set. And the goal now and what motivated us to work on Mobi is to bring these three modalities together and be able to explore them in a joint setting. And since we've yeah, developed it for, for the Platinaris data set. Uh, we've also used it for quite a few other projects, sort of most recently for um, a different project at Amble and University of Heidelberg to share electron microscopy tomograms and volumes that show SARS CoV 2 infected cells. Okay, now that we've talked about the, the history, let's um, yeah, talk a bit more about Mobi itself. So for the Fiji plugin, what are the main features? Sort of what do you really want to support? So the first important thing is that we want to enable browsing big image data. So um, for this, very important is to support image pyramids. So that basically means yeah, different resolution uh, to, to be able to browse different resolutions of the data that we have for smooth zooming in and out. And that's luckily something that's already supported by Big Data Viewer, so we can smoothly go through the data. Then we support bookmarks, sort of so that you can share interesting locations in the data. And importantly, we want to yeah, be able to access this data both locally and remotely. So for remote access, we support accessing data in a cloud object store, like Amazon S AWS S3. And then another important part is that we want to enable bridging of these different modalities, like for example, the electron microscopy volume and the light microscopy volumes that we have. And for this, we basically allow to display arbitrarily many image sources. But importantly, we need some way to bridge sort of the, the coordinate spaces for these 
different modalities together because of, as these things come off the microscope, they're of course in very different coordinate systems. So what is necessary for this is to register these to each other. And this is not something we support in Mobi directly, but there are a lot of software tools for this, like Elastics or Big Warp, and there's already been um, a new bias webinar on this too. But what we can at least do here is support sort of on the fly applications of these transformations that are then the result of the registration. And that's also something that's already provided by Big Data Viewer. And then finally, we want to support interaction with this derived data, like I said, mainly with these segmentations. And um, for this, yeah, we can display the segmentations with random colors, or basically having a different color for each ID in the segmentations. And in addition, we have sort of these interactive tables that yeah, can be used to look up properties associated with these objects. So just as an example for the data set here, these tables could store the genetic expression for each of the cells in, um, yeah, in the segmentation. And in addition, this uh, is also integrated with the Fiji 3D viewer to render these segmented objects in 3D. So that's the viewer in a nutshell, and uh, Christian will show you sort of how this all looks live in a second. But before that, I want to quickly talk about sort of the data specification that we have for Mobi. And I'll first talk about sort of the case when we all have this just on, on disk and want to lo um, load data locally. So then basically a Mobi project is just um, yeah, a, a folder on the file system where we have this top level Mobi project, which can have sort of different data sets beneath, where a data set is basically all the data that can be displayed together. And then this just sort of stores all the necessary metadata that we have in a JSON format, um, and then stores the images in the N5 format and sort of tables as yeah, comma separated values. And for details, you can look up sort of the exact um, specification online. So um, because of, I think my, sorry about that. Sorry, give me one second. Yeah, so um, like I said, so the data is, image data is stored in, in, in a file format. So probably many of you are not really familiar with this. So this is like a chunk and the data format. So chunk means the yeah, data in there are stored sort of in small blocks. And the idea behind this is very similar to, to HDF5, which has been around for a long time. But contrary to um, HDF5, N5 stores all these um, uh, chunks just as files, as, as separate files. So you could see sort of here on the right how this would look if we actually sort of look into one of these N5 files, basically just folders, and then these chunks that you see here stored as separate files. And so the reason for us to use this is that this allows very easy access to these files remotely in the object store. Basically, without having a server, we can just query these individual chunks from the Fiji client. And this is very similar to ZAR, sort of another new file format. And for this, there's an emerging image standard coming up, which we want to support in the future, which is OMZ ZAR driven by the OME group. So yeah, this is basically what we, we talked about how we can locally access this data, but sort of one key motivation for developing Mobi to, for us was to easily then publish data and make it available and in the cloud or remotely. And so for this, um, yeah, the, the mode is a bit different. So instead of accessing the data locally via, um, yeah, just via the file system, we, we access the data via two sources. So first, we um, put the metadata, so basically these JSON files and, and the tables that contain this to GitHub. And um, now, in addition to the previous metadata, we also store the addresses of um, these images that are then in an object store. 
So this is separate from GitHub and these images need to uh, be uploaded separately to this object store and then basically live there. And then the viewer can kind of query metadata and image addresses from, from GitHub and then also query the actual image data from the object store. And yeah, so this may look a bit complicated, but it's nice to have sort of all these smaller data under version control in GitHub. But in the future, we also want to support reading everything from the object store directly to make this easier. So yeah, this was sort of the ideas behind Mobi in a nutshell. And now Christian will take over and show you how this actually works in a live demo. OK, thank you, Konstantin. I'll share my screen. OK, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. OK, so I want to start with further acknowledgments. Um, I would like to thank Florian, Juk, and Pavel Tomanchak for having me on multiple Fiji hackathons. And one of them was really important because Tobias Peach helped me improve uh, all the code behind Movi that you will see running in a second. So that was very helpful. Thank you. And then I also want to thank Nicolas Chiarutini, with whom I uh, collaborate a lot on all these big data viewer projects. OK. So let me browse now such a data set. So this is a Fiji. And I will say open Mobi project. And this is now the scenario where the data is um, remote. So the entry point is a GitHub repository. And I think somebody also posted it in the chat so you could look what's, what's stored there. So this is the project metadata. So if I press OK, then it's going there and finding out what uh, data could be stored. And then it's showing the first data set, which is specified by this default bookmark that is um, required. And this is this eight terabyte uh, volume EM. And um, so, for example, I can zoom in now. And this works smoothly thanks to this resolution pyramids that um, Konstantin was talking about. So we can see all, all the details. Then since this is stored in these blocked chunks, um, one can also change here the orientation. So I can freely move um, the viewer plane. Um, and I can also move around in X, Y and, and look at other structures here. For example, we see some muscle cells and here's actually some very dense uh, neuron tissue. Um, let me zoom out again. So, the thing is, in 3D, you can get lost very easily. <laughs> um, so we implemented here for specifically this project a level button, which puts everything into a, this into an axis, which is natural for this data set. So because it has a bilateral symmetry, um, we can go back there. And then let me also make it nice so that the head is on the top. Um, more or less, and here you see the arms of the animal. Here's kind of the brain, the mouth, I think. OK, um, then what Konstantin talked about, uh, the point was also to overlay now gene expression uh, in situ data. So this can be done, for example, here. So we can select any of them and say, I want to also see this. So this is actually a muscle gene. So I can make it red. And then um, yeah, you can see together the EM and the LM data. And I could add any of, of the others. So there's no limitation on the, on the number of um, sources that we can show. OK, then in addition to having these different modalities in terms of light microscopy and electron microscopy, Konstantin was also talking about segmentation. So I will now add cell segmentation. So we have several things segmented here. So these are the cells. And now they are uh, displayed here. Uh, 
and there's also a table with all the cells and some features that you might have, me have um, measured. So this is right now a, a random color lookup table, but um, you can also color by other features. So for this, I actually have to load here in the table um, some additional columns from GitHub. So for example, um, Valentina uh, tried to cluster the cells by their gene expression. So, so I'm adding this table and now I'm having here a new column um, for the cells to which cluster they belong to. And now what I can do is I can say color by column and then I'm choosing the clusters and again using a random color lookup table now the coloring model changes in the table and in the animal and we can see the predicted um, like cell types based on the gene expression so let me zoom in a little bit okay and you see sometimes it takes a little bit to load so now it's a bit blurry but it gets better and better as, as it loads the higher resolution parameters now we also have an annotation mode for example here you might say hmm i think this was maybe wrongly identified this cell this should be another cell type so um, there is an annotation mode so you, you can say annotate start new annotation and let's say it um, maybe call it so the gene cluster correction or something. Then you can create new categories. I don't know, something. And then one can here select cells by control shift click. Maybe these two. Now they are highlighted and actually another feature is when you highlight a cell here, it automatically jumps also to the table row so that you could check uh, any numeric feature and then you could say, okay, these I actually think they should be this other um, annotation and then you have a new column with your annotations that you could then store and, and share with your, with your collaborators. So that's also uh, an annotation mode. Um, then finally, I want to talk about the bookmarks. So, and at the moment it's not so interesting because there's only the default bookmark, but there is a context menu which allows me to load additional bookmarks. Again, from the GitHub project. And so what we did in fact for the manuscript that we are publishing um, we made for each figure in the paper um, a bookmark so that means people can now in fiji just go there and look at the figure but in life so i will choose here the epithelial cell segmentation which is figure to be in the in the paper and if i click it takes a little bit because now it has to load a bunch of data and it's going to the place and actually this is also something where we display here the um, the cell segments um, as segmented in 3D with the uh, image J 3D viewer um, so you can look at this and as in CatMate I think every all of this is linked so for example if I click now in the 3D viewer on this cell it will in the big data viewer zoom in um, on, on, on the part of this cell and vice versa, if I would select something here, it would go back. So you can kind of conveniently um, interact with all of this. Okay, that was the live demo. Um, and then I would stop sharing and hand over to Kimberly, who will show you how you could create your own Mobi project. Or of course, I don't know if we answer questions now, but Okay, I stop sharing. Okay, perfect. I will share my screen. Let me just choose the right one and go in here. All right, cool. So you've seen a bit of what maybe you can do now and what it was made for. And my bit is kind of how can you make your own Mobi project? How can you get it working with your own data? So currently we have two ways to do this. 
The first one is this Python library that Constantine wrote. So this is really good, especially if you have very large images or you want to run it on a cluster environment, something like that, to make all of these file conversions to N5 very fast and efficient. Um, one thing though is, of course, you need Python experience to be able to use this. So we also have another way of doing this. So this is a Fiji plugin. It's part of Mobi. So if you enable the Mobi update site, you'll have it already. And this can handle any medium sized data that can be loaded in Fiji. So it'll also handle uh, virtual stacks and all of this. You've just got to bear in mind that if your image is massive, you're going to be better off using the, the Python library. All right, but then for this one, we don't need any programming experience. Cool, so I'm just gonna take you through making a really simple uh, Mobi project. We're using this example data from Julia Mizzen. So thanks very much, Julia, for letting us use the data. Um, what's nice about this data is it's a nice example of having multimodal data. So we have EM and also light microscopy and everything's been registered together. So we have some 2D EM, some 2D light microscopy, so fluorescence data, and some 3D tomograms as well, which are higher resolution uh, EM images. So I think I'll just get into it because you'll see what this data looks like anyway when I start putting it together. Okay, let me grab Fiji. So the first bit of this is you just search for Mobi and you select create new Mobi project. And it's gonna appear on my other screen. Let me just get it back up here. Cool. And then you just say what you want to call that project. So I'm going to call this yeast project because that's uh, what it's of. We click select. And then what it's doing in the background is it's making this folder structure that Constantine mentioned before. So it's making all of this metadata. I just drag this up here. Um, and just, yeah, creating this folder that's on your computer. So when it's finished doing that, it makes this little interface for you, which is going to let you make data sets and images. So a data set, again, it's a bunch of images you want to view in the same coordinate system. Uh, so it might be different samples or experiments, anything like this. We only have one, we're just going to call it yeast. And then we have images. So let me just drag those over from my other screen. You just open them like you normally would in Fiji. This is a little 2D EM image. And then you click add, current open image. You name it something informative, so I'm going to call it EM overview. Uh, at the moment, we're going to leave this as image. If you had segmentations, you just have to say it was a segmentation because it will also calculate all the default tables that you need to be able to browse around like Tissue was showing. Okay, we're going to leave it as end of five. And then we have this affine transform. So Constantine also mentioned this, this idea that you can have an affine transform and then it can be applied on the fly to, to look at different data sets. So with us, because this is 2D and we want to compare 2D and 3D, the one thing I'm going to change here is I'm going to scale it a whole bunch in Z. And you'll see why this is relevant later, but it's just so that I can have a small 3D data set. And when I scroll through it, I'll still be able to see the 2D in the background. But you'll get it in a minute. All right, so I'm just scaling it by some arbitrary amount. Um, and then normally we could just use the default settings for 2D. They're not totally optimal, so I'm actually going to set them manually. I've already found some good ones just to save me having to figure it out, so I'm just going to copy and paste them over here. I mean, this is nice as well because you can kind of see what's important about N5. So like we said, it has a this pyramidal format, and that's what this first part is specifying. So you're saying here how many layers you want. I'm saying I want three layers and how much you want to downsample each layer. So like this first one, I'm saying I want full resolution. Then I want to downsample by two times, but not the Z dimension because it's 2D, and then four times. Uh, and then the bit below that is the chunk size. So this is how big are the individual chunks we're actually loading from. And I've just kept it super simple here. So it's you know 64 by 64 for everything. Uh, I'm going to leave the compression how it is. Again, you could you could choose if you want to. We click OK. I drag it up over here. And you can see that it's already done all of the exports. So what it's done is it's converted it to N5 and made all of the metadata that we needed. All right, and then we just do that again. So we have some fluorescence data. So here we go. And exactly the same process. We add the current image. We name it something that makes sense. I probably spelled that wrong. It's fine. 
Um, and I'm going to scale it in Z because this is 2D again, just to make it a bit easier. And I'm going to use the same settings as before. So I'm just going to copy and paste them in. All right, this looks good. We click OK, and it does it. OK, so then I have a 3D data set. So this one will be slightly different. Here it is. So you can see the yeast here as we go through in 3D. The, the difference with this one is when we had these first two data sets, they were both of the same area. So you can see these have already been registered and they lie directly on top of each other. But this one is higher resolution and it's of a much smaller region. So this area here is, I think, over here. So it's a very small region in comparison. So with this one, what we've done is we've already figured out what the registration is to match these together. So to take our tomogram and put it on the EM, and I'm going to add that as an affine transform. So what it'll do is on the fly, it'll figure out where to put this <laughs> based on the affine transform that we've already calculated. All right, let, let me set that up and then it will, it will make more sense. So I add the current open image. I call it something again. But now for this affine transform, I'm going to go and find the one that we calculated for this registration. And I'm going to pop it in there. And we're just going to use the defaults for this one. You see it's writing this one's slightly bigger, so it'll take a few seconds. It's just converting it to N5 and done. All right, let's close this stuff. So at this point, it's done. We have our data set. We have all of our images. And this is all on our local file system. All the metadata is there and everything is good. Um, but one thing we can also do is we can change how images display by default. I'll just show a super brief example of that. So like this fluorescence, I could click edit. And I can drag this up here. And one thing you might want to change is, for example, the color that it gets displayed with. So this was fluorescence. And everything is going on my other screen. Annoying. Anyway, uh, I'm going to make it appear in green because it was green, green fluorescence. You update the properties, and then it's updated the next data. All right, so th this is it. And then we can just open it. So this is the same command that Tishy was showing, this open Mobi project. And then you just type in the file path where it is. This should be right. I'm pretty sure I called it the same thing. And then it will open it. So we have the same thing that Tishy was showing. We have our settings, and then we have our main window. This is our big overview image and we can you know browse around and see all of our yeast. Uh, we can add our fluorescence data and again it appears in green like we asked it to <laughs> and it's uh, properly registered so it's properly where it should be. And then let's find this tomogram. So okay this is because I rotated a little bit. So this also appears where it should be but clearly I have way too much brightness so let's just max it out a bit. And you see that that's been placed where it should be based on this affine transform. And again, it's properly 3D. So if I just get rid of this, so you can have a quick look, you can see the whole thing and browse around with 2D and 3D. OK, so I think that's most of the basics. So I'll go back to my presentation. Mm -hmm. And it's here. All right, yeah. So at this point, you've got the project set up. You've got it locally on your file system or on your local server or whatever. You can browse it and still do all of the things that Tishy showed you. Um, but at some stage, you might want to share your project. So then there's a few extra steps. So again, this is mirroring <laughs> what Constantine said. You'd have to take your image data and copy it into your object store. The structure that you set up is exactly the same. So it should be you know, one step process of moving it all onto the object store. You have to add your image locations to the project metadata. So this is just a few extra files that say, uh, for example, what's the name of your object store, what kind of authentication, that sort of thing. Uh, at some point, this will be able to be done automatically. Um, it's in, I, it'll be there soon. I haven't finished writing it yet, but it'll be there. Um, and then the last thing is to copy all of your project metadata to GitHub. So to put it in a public repository. So at this stage, we have the two bits done. You've got all the images in the object store, all the metadata on GitHub. And now you can just give people the GitHub repository address and they can just type it in like we did for the Plashy browser and they should be able to view it all together. All right, so with that, I think I just have one more slide saying if you want more information on it, this is the, the GitHub address. 
Um, there are some, uh, some readmes and some, some tutorials there to get you going. Uh, also, we're happy to receive uh, feature requests or issues or anything from there. So that's also fine. And also feel free to contact us if you want some help with getting set up. We're always happy to help you well. And yeah, I think with that, we're done. And we can take some questions if people have some. So thanks a lot again to all three. Very, very impressive. Very nice to see the smooth uh, view of the data and overlays. And it was really good also that you walked us through how to do this. So I think that I, I really liked it. And again, for the questions, you were very fast in replying. Moderators were very fast. I think maybe we, I can still pick up some again, even if they were already asked, uh, answered. And for example, one was um, if the data is inside that Git data, database um, file or where is it exactly stored? So maybe, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, just to, yeah, quickly, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, to quickly clarify it. Yeah, so no, the actual raw image data is stored on this object store. So exa for example, on like an a a AWS S3 store and GitHub only holds like the small metadata that we have because of course it's not possible to put like these huge yeah, files mm. under version control on GitHub. Let's see. Um, I think so. I I was wondering since when you gave the example where the cells were already segmented, then you get a uh, much more features when you have the segmentation, right? Because then you can click on the cells and you have this very beautiful zooming in to that data and so on. Also in the parameters, and maybe even if it's not. A movie related question, but you could maybe um, tell us again how you did the segmentation. You, could, uh, you loaded it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so this was my part of the project too. Um, and so this is basically like a unit, so like a deep learning network that predicts the boundaries of the cells. And then on top of this, like a clustering algorithm that sort of yeah, take, make sort of the um, watershed over segmentation and then clusters these together to segment all these cells in the volume. Well, in, so do you did not use Elastic for that? Or you, uh, no, you, not, uh, not for yeah. that, but for mm -hmm. some easier sort of parts, mm -hmm. we did use Elastic. So we also had like segmentations of some of the tissue, like, I don't know, the gut or the neuropil that you maybe saw. And for this, we have fused Elastic. Mm -hmm. And then I don't know whether you want to pick again a question that is was already answered. I mean, there uh, are new, uh, Anna, there are new questions appearing. I could pick one. Yes, please. That's great. Uh -huh, yeah, Steve, you're very good. <laughs> Steve is asking: Could Mobi image data be from an Omero server? I think current simple answer is no. We haven't tried that. But also, I mean, the data would have to be stored in this pyramidal chunked format for this to be performant. And I'm not sure. I think some of the data, yeah, I'm not, I don't know enough about this Omera, Omero backend stuff. So um, currently not possible. And whether it would be possible, I don't know. So I cannot, yeah, Steve, I don't know exactly. But it's an interesting idea, definitely. There's also the question, how did you pre-compute the gene expression? I was actually also interested in this. <laughs> what was done there? <laughs> Unfortunately, the person that did that is not part of the three of us. Uh, so I don't know if somebody dares to answer, Constantine. I mean, I can, yeah, I, I think I can give a quick uh, overview, right? So we uh, have like all these in situ that, that show the gene expression already that we've registered. And then we just basically measure the kind of volumetric overlap that we have in our common coordinate space, right? So that we, we take the gene and we measure, uh, or sorry, we take each of the cells and for each of the genes, we measure how much of the cellular volume overlaps with this mm -hmm. gene expression. That was sort of the simpler way to do it. And then we also looked at a bit more complicated way 
So if that looked more like how consistent these different expressions are, but sort of for, for the simple example we show, we use just this sort of, yeah, by volume overlap. Mm. Cool, thanks. Uh, maybe so I can just pick the next question mm -hmm. because this is also about uh, segmentation. So the question is if there's a dynamic mechanism for updating the data set. So for example, for rerunning the segmentation. Uh, so currently there's nothing really dynamic in the sense of that you can do this while having a live Mobi instance. So what we usually did for this, we kind of create sort of a new version of the segmentation, like a completely new, new volume, and then yeah, store this beside sort of the old version, um, which was actually one of the reasons why we had this metadata in, in Git, because this way we could sort of keep track at least of the different metadata files for, for the segmentation. But, but I think, I mean, since these are these N5 files in principle, you could just in a running Mobi rewrite these chunks, I think. I mean, it might crash a little bit, but it's um, it's thinkable, right? Um, so I think yeah. one could just try it. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Then another one, I think. There's the last, yeah, whether about the N5 data, whether it's readable on Mobi, like the cat, uh, cat made N5. Um, is it readable on Mobi and vice versa? So I would have to ask Tom, I don't know how, what kind of N5 flavor you are using. Is Tom still around? I am, yes. Um, I've, so I'm not aware of any particular flavors. So far we just use sort of regular uh, N5s that came out of the Southfield lab. I believe uh, Chris Barnes did a little bit more work with this. Um, but so far, if they conform to the regular attributes JSON uh, format, then we can read them directly without issues. Yeah, and I, so. I think on our side, right, sort of there's kind of a bit of a specification on top that comes from Big Data Viewer, which basically just needs some additional metadata stored in this attributes.json. So we would need to have these and then also some more metadata. But so I would think it probably doesn't work sort of off the shelf. But it would probably only take a very few changes, right? You wouldn't need to rewrite any of the data. You would just need to add some metadata. Good. And then there is a new question that appeared. Do you have plans to support thin pl plate spline transforms? Uh, I can try to take that. I, I think that might exist already. So the person to thing there would be John Bogovich from the Saalfeld lab. And I, I think um, it might be already some possible to do, to, to have this not only a fine, but also more complex transformations uh, that are applied on, on the fly. But um, John Bogovich Saalfeld lab is your man. So <laughs> ask, ask him what the current status is, but I know he was looking into this. Good question, Matt, thank you. Mm. Okay. So I think with that, we reached the end. So thanks again for, to all the speakers. It was a super interesting webinar for uh, all participants. So there is a survey, exactly. Doku just sends the link. Please fill out the survey. Also, you will find then all the questions answered at the forum.image.sc at some point when they are uploaded. And also the recording of that webinar will be uploaded then after a bit of editing. So thanks a lot for joining us and we hope to see you in the next New Bias Academy webinars.